Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Hello, Connected Yoga Teacher friends, and welcome to episode 116 of the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast. I want to tell you a little secret of what went on behind the scenes of this episode with Shelly Prosco. So Shelly has been on the podcast before. If you want to hear more about her introduction, then I am going to link to that episode As Shelly and I got talking in this interview, I realized that we were covering so much ground and I had this plan that I would go back and cut out the things that maybe were extra things. And when I went back, I realized I can't do it. There's too much here. Shelly had provided so much that I felt like I couldn't cut it out. And so that's why we have a two-part episode now with Shelly. If you haven't listened to the two episodes before this, episode 114 with Diane Liska is about compassion fatigue and episode 115 with Dr. Ginger Garner about the polyvagal theory, I strongly encourage you to check them out. These four episodes, the two from before and today's and next week's are all interrelated and tie in so well with each other. In today's episode, Shelly and I continue a conversation that we started having when we met in person at the Accessible Yoga Conference in Toronto. It's about communication and language as yoga teachers, and when people turn to yoga in search of healing, they often can have a lot of pain. As yoga teachers, we may not realize how important our language is, or we do realize and we really want to try and work on it, but sometimes it can be challenging and frustrating. Shelly talks about this topic in a way that makes it playful and fun and just a let's try this on, try these words, try these cues instead of the other ones. As a pain care yoga trainer, Shelly Prosco joins me on this episode today to share with us her expertise in this area and some of her tips and strategies for being more aware of language when guiding a yoga class. She also, in next week's episode, reveals some of the insights from her soon-to-be-published book. I am so excited about this. It's called Yoga and Science in Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain. Now, this is a collaborative book. Shelley has worked on it with many other individuals, and I'm going to let her talk about the different topics in that book. So whether you're teaching yoga or you want to learn more about trauma-informed yoga or you just want to be more conscious of how your language can either trigger or alleviate someone's pain response, this episode is full of great nuggets of wisdom that you can apply to your classes right away. If you are a new listener, welcome. My name is Shannon Crow. I'm a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant working for yoga teachers. And this podcast was created for you so that you can connect to the information and inspiration every single week between the classes, workshops, and events that you're either teaching or attending. This is a place where you can feel supported as you navigate the jungles of yoga entrepreneurship. All of the links for today's episode and the show notes are at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 116. Before we hear from Shelly, let's listen to our hot tip of the week from Brendan over at Schedulicity. Hey there, Connected Yoga Teachers. This is Brendan with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Schedulicity takes all of the guesswork out of creating an online business. You can stay organized and keep your booking, class rosters, payment processing, detailed analytic reports, and email marketing all in one place. Offer deals and stay in contact with your clients effortlessly. It's easy to follow our step-by-step setup instructions, and you never even have to leave the couch while you professionally establish your business or take your existing organization to the next level. Thank you so much, Brendan and Team Schedulicity. If you don't know what Schedulicity is and you're looking for an online software that helps you with your schedule, go and check it out. You will not regret it. So as I said, we heard from Shelly Prosco a long time ago on the podcast in episode nine, and it was part of the Pelvic Health mini series. Shelly is a physiotherapist, yoga therapist, author, international speaker, and educated who is dedicated to the integration of yoga into modern healthcare. And she has over 20 years of experience in the field. 
She's also a pain care yoga trainer and works at expanding knowledge and education on topics surrounding persistent or chronic pain, pelvic health, compassion, and professional burnout. I am so excited today to introduce you to Shelly. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Shelly. It's great to have you back. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for this talk. Me too. The first time that we met in person was in Toronto at the Accessible Yoga Conference. And I remember we were walking to go get something to eat and you started to chat with me about pain language. Maybe it was after I listened to your presentation, but I just thought I need you to come and talk on the podcast about this. So tell us what got you interested in this topic. Oh boy, um, in the language surrounding pain, you mean? Mm-hmm. Typically? Uh, you know, I think it depends. There's many layers to this, but I think it really may have just started with my work with Neil Pearson. Um, so the physical therapist, um, yoga therapist, he's UBC professor. Um, I think probably, have you had him on the show? I haven't. So um, your listeners maybe don't, aren't totally familiar with him. But anyways, he, um, I started, he's been working with uh, the teaching about the science surrounding pain, working with his pain care yoga, which is integrating yoga um, and pain science, pain education, the lived experience of pain and helping teach yoga teachers, yoga therapists, healthcare professionals on how to integrate yoga for people in pain. And like I said, really integrating that pain science as well. So he's been doing this for decades. Um, I was first introduced to his work probably in the late 90s. And then I met him 10 or more years ago and started working with him and train and got training, um, trained with him. And I consider him still a teacher, mentor, um, colleague and friend now as well. Anyways, um, so I got interested in this language because really uh, working with people in pain, I wanted to get better, be better, be more effective. And Neil's work in this area helped guide me. And he is a stickler for language, um, not because of his personality or anything, but as of that's what people in pain, the lived experience of pain was telling him and informing him over his decades of working with people in pain. So I've learned a lot from him. I've learned a lot, obviously, from people in pain, um, you know, and being a clinician. And also the third thing is just what the science surrounding pain is telling us. And so it's that also learning from people like Laura Mosley, David Butler. Um, if any one of your listeners are um, interested or at all familiar with even their work, um, they're with, uh, they're pain researchers and they're in Australia and they have a book, Explain Pain and Explain Pain Supercharge, all around all about pain education and the science surrounding pain. And they came up with the idea of dims and sims, so danger in me versus safety in me. And so for people in pain um, that have been suffering from persistent pain or chronic pain for a long time, um, they, there can be certain changes in the brain and the nervous system that makes the nervous system more hypervigilant, we say, or, you know, really more sensitive. And so we try to do everything that we can as practitioners to help people seek out or find what is more safe, like what, what brings more safety in me, whether it's a relationship or a movement or a breath or a color or a smell or whatever. So what aspects in my life, you know, bring more safety to me? And then what aspects in my life bring more danger in me? Um, and that could be, like I said, any, anything from the people you see, talk to, the places you go, you know, everything. So language is part of that. So how can, so our language as a, as a practitioner is very important. So are we creating more of the dims, the danger in me and the people with our language, or are we creating more of the sims, the safety in me? So that was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I can tell that you're really passionate about it. And 
I remember leaving the conference that weekend and and changing my language just from our walk to go get something to eat and from your talk. And I remember one of them being the difference of chronic pain to saying persistent pain. That was one of the things that I remember walking away thinking, okay, that really makes a difference. Mm-hmm. You know, do you want me to do you want me to uh mess you up some more? Yeah. <laughs> rock the boat a little bit more. Yeah. Um, So one thing that has come to my attention since that conversation, which was just six months ago, um, was on this whole chronic and persistence. So yes, so chronic pain tends to have this connotation that, you know, it's doomsday, it's chronic, you can't change it, you're going to have it forever. It's sort of a negative feel to it, right? Chronic pain. Mm -hmm. We like to, and when I say we, this is a lot of people in the pain science or the, the world surrounding pain, like people who are really interested in learning more about the science surrounding pain and clinicians and researchers. And so in those circles and different, at different summits and conferences and things like that, we, and even in the literature, um, we're trying to use the word persistent. So when, when you look at some of the the research, we're trying to change that to say persistent pain because persistent makes it sound potentially, you know, that it is, pain is changeable. We know that because of neuroplasticity, bioplasticity, pain can be changed. Um, We never used to know that or think that. So persistent just makes it sound, you know, pain is persisting. And these are the changes that happen in your brain and your nervous system and other systems when pain persists. So we like to call it persistent pain. Now, We have to also respect the lived experience of pain, meaning what are people in pain saying? You know, how do they think about this term? And, you know, it turns out that maybe some people um, that are suffering from persistent pain, they, and and maybe it's initially, and maybe they, once they learn more more, more and more about pain, then they might change their mind as well. But initially, they prefer the term chronic pain because it's more validating for you know, and it's, it's, so now are we slighting, you know, their experience, right? And saying, well, you don't have chronic pain, you have just this persistent pain, and it's not as bad. And so, you know, that opens up a whole can of worms for more conversation, but it it just, it really comes down to just, you know, just listening, 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 listening to understand, um, you know, people in pain and their experiences and learn from, from them. Right. this is really reminding me of the episode we were just chatting about. Yeah, right? About yeah. accessible language. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what does a person... It's... Yeah. Sorry, Shannon, I interrupted you there. Oh, no, I was just going to say, it's like, what does the person that is in front of you, what are they, what's their preference? Right, yeah. And and to be uh, playful about it too, and and you mentioned this on that podcast, and and I say this all the time too, like, don't get you know, overwhelmed and caught up and stressed out about it. Um, have some self-compassion, um, you know, practice self-compassion is important. And it's so, like, it's okay. And we could like you and I were laughing and, you know, about language and it's just, oh man, but don't, don't get stressed about it. And it's just nice to just keep learning, just be open. And it's okay if you say, if you, like, I, I do like to say persistent pain. And so I still choose that. And uh, I'm not going to not say it because now, have this sort of new understanding that oh well maybe some people do it's just good to know that that's all and right. in our book that we're um, writing that's what we we decide we talk about that in the book in the in the introduction and so in the book what you'll notice is that we we do purposely interchange chronic and persistent and you may notice that when we're talking about it at least you know a lot in my writing I like to say persistent pain and then sometimes when I use chronic it's intentional and it, it's like, okay, now I'm, I'm actually talking about this specific kind of diagnosis. So I'm going to say chronic pain, or maybe I'll choose pro- chronic pain for SEO, ser- like for right. search engine optimization. optimization, because people are not going to plug that in. And, and I'm doing that. So people see the information that I'm writing, like right. I want people with chronic pain, right? Persistent pain to be reading this stuff, getting access to it. So we don't want to be using the term necessarily persistent pain in titles and 
you know, so you want to say chronic pain, and then within the body of the work, you can make the distinction. And but it, there's no black and white. Like you'll see both, and it's not right or wrong. So I wanted to bring that up just to know that like you don't always have to like say persistent pain. Like there's a time and place, and so if you're wondering, you'll notice I go in and out of it too, and I I do that. You know, sometimes. Well, I always do it intentionally because I always want to say now. I've trained myself to say persistent pain and people with persistent pain. And so I, I have to consciously think, okay, I'm going to say chronic because this person will understand that more than I'm, when I'm talking to them or whatever. Right. Oh, that's so interesting. I want to go backwards a moment and then come back to your book. So you had said two terms that I just would love you to define because we talk about neuroplasticity all the time on the podcast. And I, I feel like some of the terms we need to say, like that's what this is, but you just also said bioplasticity. And I feel like neuro is brain. And this is like, we know that we can make new neural pathways. I don't know if that's right, but what is bioplasticity? (laughs) Well, it's a new, a relatively newer term. And it's just, when we talk about neuroplasticity, like you said, the brain and the nervous systems can change. We know that now. Um, and a new term saying, well, hey, our whole being, our whole, our whole human experience, you know, really can change. So we look at the world of epigenetics, we can change the expression of our genes and our immune systems, you know, hormonal systems, cardiovascular system, like just our whole, our whole being potentially has the capacity for change. So, uh, yeah. So that's I, nice. I like that because it's not just this brain walking around. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's the thing with pain. And if, if, if you look at the science surrounding pain and, and some of the literature, a lot of it talks so much about, or talks so much about the nervous systems and the brain. And we know that brain is an output of the brain. So we have all the, the danger signals and everything coming up from the tissues, goes up the spinal cord. There's lots of processes that go on to, to decide whether or not that message continues up to the brain. So it may or may not. And then if it does in the brain, there's a big story that has to go on in there. So you, the brain takes into consideration everything, your thoughts, your emotions, your expectations, the state of your immune system, the state of your hormonal system, your like everything, it makes a story. And then the output is the pain experience, which could be a physical sensation of what we call pain, but it could also be breath changes or fear, anxiety, muscles give out, muscles clamp up and spasm. Um, there's that, and that's your output of the, the, out, the brain is doing that. So that the output of the brain is the pain experience and pain is not a thing. If you don't have right. it, pain is not a thing. Pain's a, it's a phenomenon and it's an experience. And, um, but we're even changing language there too and saying, cause um, you know, we were just talking about neuroplasticity versus bioplasticity and that change in language a little bit. But um, the output of the brain is that's what we're saying in pain science education so much. And then, like you said, we started to think, well, we're not just walking brains. And so now what people like Laura Mosley are leading pain researcher. He's got like over 300 papers over decades. He, um, you know, he's starting to use the term pain as an output of the human. Oh, instead of the brain. Yeah. So pain is an output of the human. Oh, that's really... And it's an experience. And then some people pick apart, well, output, like it, it's uh, it's not a thing. So it's not just this output of the human. It's it's an experience, like I said, or a phenomenon. You know that. Yeah. So it's, it's really, you know, when you get deep into this, and like, so you have to have fun. You have to be playful because what happens when we get overwhelmed with this language? I don't know about you, but I, I'm sure most people can relate. I know for me... I, you freeze up, you fear, I get irritated, I get angry, I get apathetic. Mm-hmm. So for, for, no, forget it. Like, I've been told this, this, now this, now I can't say this, I can't, what, you can't say anything anymore, kind of conversation, right? And we have those conversations, I'm sure, sometimes with our friends and family, right? Yeah. So yeah. Different topics, and it's like, well, you can't do this, and you can't, you can't say that. And so then we just shut down, and we don't care. So we got to watch, like, we don't want to get to that point. We want to have, we want to explore, we're learning. Um, 
you know, don't, don't get, like I said, too stressed out about it, but it's interesting to know. And I, and when I look at my trajectory over, I guess my whole life, but really within the last, I would say like 15 years, like I feel maybe even just 10 years, I feel like I've had for whatever reason, more of a passion to, to learn and question. And it has been more fun learning and progressing. And I feel like I'm uh, just a kinder person, like, cause I'm more open and I just have a little more compassion, respect. And, you know, you were talking about inclusivity and accessibility on that podcast with um, Essie and Katie and Chantal, which was awesome. Um, and so I do feel like I'm just, I don't want to say a, a better, um, that's not the right word, see language. I just, I just feel like I'm a little bit more uh, open, aware, kinder, and I just show up a little better during, you know, the day. Um, you know, does that? That really makes sense. It does. Uh, and uh, I know the difference. I see the difference that language can make in my own body and my own life and also people that I work with. So would you say that's the driving force behind it? Like give us an example if you can of how you've seen language turn someone around from their pain story and it being really negative to, to being more empowering. Can you think of an example? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Oh, of course I have like so many and then to pick one. (laughs) Well, I have an example of someone, I don't know, like it's not necessarily uh, a profound, like one statement or one, (laughs) it's more of just overall the concept. And, um, and it was a patient of mine that was suffering from persistent back pain, like 20 years, several surgeries. And over years, he's had lots of different treatment. And he was always told that his spine had to be uh, neutral and stable. And so, uh, you know, lots of course stability. So there's the term stability in the air quotes. So course stability exercises, keep your spine neutral to protect the spine. So those words protect the spine, keep it stable. Um, and, and I think language now, of course, I'm not someone who is there what, you know, listening to all the messages that he was given over the years, but you can tell messages that people are given by how they speak. Right. So he would use those terms, you know, well, I need to, you know, protect when I'm going down. And then you just watch how the person is moving. So, for example, you know, just coming up the stairs to the studio where I was working with him and then just watching him, um, you know, put his his belongings, his wallet and his keys down on the chair. Sometimes we didn't have a chair and he would just put, you know, the stuff on the floor. Sometimes I do that on purpose to see how, and um, all his spine was just rigid and straight. There was no movement. And even working with him over time, it just took him a really, really long time to even venture the thought of going into like, a posterior anterior tilt or just moving the spine even just a little bit. Um, and then even once we got the spine moving, like let's say you're doing cat and cow or you're, oh, that's great. And you're, you're doing really well and smooth and nice breath. Um, as soon as you, he would go back to, okay, the session was over. He'd go right back to that stable spine, like functionally. Right. So he, his keys, as you bend down, <laughs> make sure don't bend that spine at all. Um, so long story, but, um, over time, you know, we're, we're together and it's comes in stages and phases and pain, science, education, and just him learning more and more. And once he started to realize these concepts of, he didn't need to protect the spine. He didn't have to keep it stable. The, the spine's robust and resilient. And so this language just you know, once that changed, just the way that I would speak to him. So I never talked about, I never mentioned the word stability. I didn't talk about protecting the spine. I didn't use words like keep, you know, keep the spine stable or don't do this or don't do that. Or you don't want to be like that or careful. So as you're coming up now, careful, like, so just take that all out of the vocabulary and, um, you know, just 
maybe replacing it with things that you can say mindfully if you want the person to stay present with full presence, you know, mindfully, you know, bring your, if you're going into, let's say, a cat-cow or a flexion um, position or extension. Um, so I think really just, first of all, getting rid sort of of all that language, but that, of course, comes, it, it's also in conjunction with the person understanding you know, pain as well. Like it's both, but, um, would you explain that to someone? Would you say, let's try and replace, or do you just slowly do it as an example? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's going to depend. Um, I try not to, that's a really good question and it's going to be a long answer. I can, (laughs) (laughs) that's okay. Um, so in, and, and I have to remember the audience I'm talking to too, like if there's a lot of yoga teachers and, you know, if you're, if you're teaching a class setting, like that's different, like that I'm teaching one-on-one in a therapeutic session. Yeah. So in a yoga class and things like that, like, no, like you're not, you don't have to get all chatty and talk like that. One-on-one um, depends yes and no, and it's in layers. So um, I would say as a more generally speaking, I probably... I don't think I've ever started to explain how I'm changing my language right away with the person, like right. day one. Like it's just, there's just too much. There's so much to do on day one. I'm mostly just listening and seeing where they're at. And But, you know, as you start introducing the science surrounding pain or just the concept, the very simple concept of the danger signal, it's not a pain signal, like that just might be, you know, day two, to three, and then you give them some home videos to watch that explain pain. And then language, I might, like your question is, do I explain it to them or do do I just do it? Uh, Later on, I might Mm -hmm. explain it. So yeah, but I think just thinking back to this one example, I'm not sure that I ever really explained to him, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm not going to use those words anymore. I think we probably both, he probably figured it out as time went on together. (laughs) Right. Like, cause, and then just to fast forward. So, you know, after the year or so he, like, if I wish, you know, what we need to do, we need to, we need to have patience. So he needs to be here with me, you know, and so he could uh, articulate his experience, but I think he would say, well, I know, I'm pretty sure he would say, cause we've had these discussions before. He's, he very much understands the language you know, placebo or sorry, um, nocebo language. Nocebo language? Do you so, want to... Yeah. So nocebo is like um, kind of the opposite of placebo to a degree. So nocebo is like when you have adverse or detrimental effects um, on your health that are produced or that are happening because of these uh, psychological factors or negative expectations. So nocebo effect would be, for example, well, telling somebody that, um, make sure, okay, so bend your knees, so forward fold, let's say, as you're coming down, bend your knees to protect your spine. Ah, okay. To protect your spine, you don't need to say, even say bend your knees, that's fine, but you just get rid of the, you don't need to say to protect your spine, and that protect your spine can suggest to the person that their spine is fragile. Um, it's fear mongering type language potentially, and that can create a nocebo effect. So those expectations psychologically can then produce an actual detrimental or adverse effect in the body. Right. So no, that, that's the no. So just like placebo is the, it's like the positive effect um, by suggestions or expectations, same, like sort of there's the opposite, the nocebo effect. And we know this, this, we know this with pain, like the science surrounding pain. Like I said, the dims and the sims, safety and me, danger and me. So language, this isn't something that, you know, me and a few of my colleagues are <laughs> good idea. Um, you know, this has been driven by the science surrounding Hi, Connected Yoga Teachers. Just popping in here for one little note. Next, Shelly and I moved on to talking about cues and pain language. I love how she took the time to jot down some notes. And in next week's episode, listen in when I ask if she wants to share a screenshot of her notes. It is worth listening to. 
But here's Shelly with her amazing list of cue considerations. I did reflect on what we were going to talk about today and I wrote some things down and um, just some different cues like that. I mean, we can still, like I said, say things like, you know, bend your knees and things like that, but just taking out the, to protect your spine or in order to keep the spine stable or, you know, direct, avoiding sort of those directives, like be careful or keep, you know, make sure you keep or make sure ensure like you find yourself saying keep or put or make sure ensure you know anything that kind of follows after that you might be creating this oh careful or oh make sure you keep the no the the knee over the the whatever (laughs) knee don't make sure you don't have the knee go past your toes or um oh or I guess I'm saying, oh, you know, I'm not okay, just not that we say that, but like if you say um, you're in warrior two or one or whatever, and you say, be careful not to bring, careful not to have the to- the knee fall inwards. Right. You know, like just you don't have to say careful. You know, you can say you can say if you want, and we'll, I would like to talk about this later on. I have some really great bullet points on why we cue alignment and when it's important. And, um, but you know, if you wanted to say track the knee over the second toe, like you can say that, but just don't don't. What's your intention? Like, are you saying it? And if you're saying it because you think it's creating safety, then your language is going to reflect that. But if right. if, if you if you're more knowledgeable and you understand that that's not creating safety, you might be doing that alignment cue for different reasons. But if you know it's not safety, then you're not going to say, oh, be careful. Oh, there's my oh again. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I like how you use this because it, it, and just for all the yoga teachers out there who have said something or are saying something, I can think of a billion examples oh, yeah. of when I've done this to students yeah. because I heard it and then I passed it down. So we'll just throw that like teacher guilt out the window. And we still do. I mean, I yeah. st- it's not about that. Yeah, we're, this is, we're having fun. We're learning. And, but I do have some important things to share. That's why I'm on here, right? I want to yeah. help people just understand a little bit and think a little more. Well, it's so interesting. Students were in a class the other night and we had a pelvic floor physio come in and they were talking about warrior. And then someone in the class, I think it was a yoga teacher said, should we keep our knee here? And she just said, do you want to? <laughs> I mm-hmm. just love her so mm-hmm. much. Yeah. She was like, yeah. how does it feel? Okay. Yeah. So that, that would be, you know, watch it. And then, or, um, or here's another one I hear and that I said a lot, um, try not to anymore, like to save the word save, like to save your wrists. Right? Oh, or save, to protect your, your wrists. To put, yeah. So the word protect, um, care, wait, or, like I'll just repeat these again. Just if you say something like "make sure" or "please make sure" or "keep," that's a big one. Like keep your, you know, keep your arm here, keep your hip, keep your hip square. Like you're telling, that's a directive. You're telling people, you know, what to do, and I'll give you some options. And what about putting a blanket under the knees? Often I would say to protect your knees. Yeah, don't. I would stop oh. that. Yeah, you can say place a blanket under your knees if that feels more comfortable. But you okay. can get rid of the protect because that's not that's that's fear mongering language and it's suggesting the body's fragile and like that's not you know you might say uh, sometimes I like to say put a blanket under your knees uh, for a little more luxury like if you're on your right and then I you know I'd be playful with it too I'm like oh that feels so good like I love that it's cushiony you know but. You don't need to use those, you know, words protect or the wrists, like bring your wrists, you know, underneath the shoulders or to say, or, you know, something like to say, save your wrists and bring them a little more in front. Like you don't have to say, save them. <laughs> like they're as if they're in some dire need. <laughs> like you're only going to get these two wrists and then that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so those are some things. And then, so what I would say like as alternatives and, you know, it's, it's basically giving people permission, obviously, to do, you know, different things. But you can say, 
Like, let's say you do want someone to be, and I'm going to say in air quotes, like just more careful or just more mindful. I, I like using the word mindful. So if you're coming in and out of a pose and let's say you are doing shoulder stands or whatever, and you want, like, what word do you use? You want to say careful. Like you can say mindful. Right. That's been big for me. Like that, I, you know, or when I transitioning, a lot of injuries can happen. Most, a lot of times they happen in the transitions into and out of poses. Um, you know, so you want people to be mindful. So you're coming into something, you know, mindfully, mindfully. And, and that I, so I like that. And, or if you want to say mindful every second sentence in your class, um, you could be, you know, <laughs> stay fully present as you move this or with full presence, if you're a little more poetic. And what can, about slowly moving slowly? Yeah, slowly. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Slowly is good. And then watching that now again, just check yourself, even audio tape yourself. And, and I do have that written down actually, Shannon, like slowly, but again, we're just watching, like, are we like always saying it now slowly? So if you're in, and I'm going to talk about this too. I want to talk about this, a tone of voice and stuff, but like, are we saying, you know, slowly going and then the next time slowly, like, right. It doesn't always need to be there. Yeah. Like, does it, do you always have to be, life is, <laughs> right? So, um, I love know, how you talked about taping it. Good. Yeah, tape yourself with a, a class once in a while and just listen back and then do the class. So take it from yourself. It's really, it's helpful. Um, you can use words like uh, pay, like pay attention. So you're, let's say you're doing something, pay attention, you know, or focus on. Um, and there's some other things. I like using language like, see if you can. So this is kind of going to like giving people permission and options. Um, see if you can bring your knee a little more over the second toe. Like just see what happens. Um, try this. Uh, and this is, this is in general, but especially, you know, we're looking at the people with pain that maybe can't do something or, you know, it's just not accessible to them, but it could be for everybody. So try or try this or try not to. So you could say, you know, try not to in a playful kind of tone. So let's say you're in warrior three and everyone like has got their hips kind of stacked and you really like to have everyone just try to square the hips. Um, Again, nothing to do with safety or anything. It's just to give them a different experience. And there's other maybe bullet points why you might want to try to do that to give a different experience on the standing leg and et cetera. Um, But you could just, you know, say, try Try not to have that free hip come up. See if you can bring it down. Um, so I like that kind of language. So see if you can try, try not to, if you're able to, that's a nice one too. If you're able to, um, what happens if, that's another, that's a nice statement. So, you know, let's say you're in um, downward dog and the knees are straight and someone's really in that posterior pelvic tilt and thoracic kyphosis. And you're like, what happens if you bend your knees? What does that feel like? And then, and then try straightening them again and have them explore and go back and forth. And so we're not directive, you know, and telling them that you have to do it this way or have to do it this way. You're exploring. And if you see two people in the class that are doing something that you feel like you could maybe make it more easeful for them, you don't have to point the people out. You could bring the whole class and tell everyone what happens if you bend the knees? Okay, now straight. And then just you go back and forth between the two and then let people explore. You can say things like, um, what, like, so if you're going through the two extremes, so like come into a posterior pelvic tilt, like let's say you're a mountain pose. So get people, yeah, come into that posterior pelvic tilt. Now come into the full anterior pelvic tilt and you can demonstrate and then get people to kind of find, you know, the middle what feels good for you. You're just having people play um, and then saying what feels, you know, most easeful for you. And you, I like using words too. Like sometimes if I want to have a sense of like strength and I really try hard to stay away from the word stability because it, it, it has this connotation that if you're not that way, it means your spine or your body is unstable. Right. Right. So people, when we say stable, that often people think like their joints going to be falling apart and loose. So I like to say like find strength without the rigidity. 
you know, find, find some strength without a rigidity or find a sturdiness without a rigidity. Um, other options I might say for people in pain, especially like maybe today you feel like trying this, you know, or explore. That's another word to use. Explore. So I'm just giving you lots of different kind of keywords and I'm hoping people kind of write them down because that's what I do. <laughs> that's great. So, and then choose your own adventure. I, I, I got that one from another yoga teacher. It's not mine, but I like that one. So you can give options and then say, now choose your own adventure. Um, so avoid directives. Give permission and options. Um, I would like to say too, is for a couple things here on keeping up op- or giving people options, watching how we're giving the options so that it's not like, this is level one, two, and three. Right. Not the uh, full expression of the pose. Or yeah. Anything. Yeah. So it's, you've probably, you know, already had people say that before on this podcast and a lot of your listeners. I think it was Amber Carnes that really. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. And that when one way that I like to kind of get around that too, is I'll say like for, let's say you're in tree pose or something and you want to bring like where to put the hands. Um, so you can just mix it up and just, you can start on your hips and then maybe go straight up in the air, heart center out to the side. So there's no, you know, this one's better than the other. You just say, choose your own adventure, you know, or so that there's that. So just watching when you are giving options and, um, and then with the giving the permission, just, you know, be cognizant about how are we, are we creating an environment that gives people you know, the sense of safety, confidence, and the courage to go grab a block or, or to use the chair. So we can say that all we want and, you know, we'll grab a chair if you need to, or use the wall, but you know, what, what kind of space or community have we created? So people really do feel the courage to go and do that. And so we can, you can be creative, right. And how you do that and going back to tone and, um, I'm good. I am going to talk about this, but I'm going to leave it if like later on within the podcast, just because I want to keep going with these points, but I want to talk about voice and communication, but like, are you saying um, when you give people options to go to the wall is the tone, you know, like, Oh, and you can go to the wall. If you need to, if you, if you need to hold on to something. Yeah. And not that any of us talk that way, like, cause we, we don't, but if the intention is, you know, the energy behind the intention is if you are really believing that the, the wall is maybe a lesser of an experience, right. That will come out in your voice. So it's, you know, if we can really explain, believe that it's just a different experience it's providing different feedback um it can be it's not not any more or less valuable it's just totally different and you know and then that will come out in your voice so there's there's that so and then um a couple more are you okay can I give you a couple? yeah these are great yeah um yeah <laughs> um no I just I had thought about it and I had all these points so um and don't uh, we don't want to com- have people comparing day to day. I think we all know that, so especially people in pain. The pain changes. They can have flare ups, and that could be not just day to day, but they might have six months of, you know, doing really great or making kind of progress per se. Um, and then they have three months after that, and they're at a totally different level. Yes. Right. So we just have to make sure that we understand that it's not about that. I think most people are good with that. And then watch our, we're not making global claims like, um, you know, the, the, if the hip flexors are tight because they attach to the spine, that's going to pull your pelvis forward and, and give you more back pain. Like just don't, those are claims that are unsubstantiated and, you know, they're just global claims that aren't accurate or if your hamstrings are tight, you know, that's because they're attached here to your sit bones, you know, you may say if your hamstrings are tight, that's going to pull in your pelvis and create more strain in the low back. Like you don't, you don't have to say those things, you know, it just, it doesn't help. Right. And, it's not like we and have, not, ex- and they're not accurate. Statements. Right. Not accurate. And we can't know what's going on in someone's body. No, they're, they're global claims. So I would say, watch that kind of 
language. And really it takes the pressure off because you don't, you don't need to know the mechanisms. Like you're, you're providing, you're, pro, you don't, you don't have to tell people, like I said, you know, what to do or what they should be doing. You're just, you're providing this experience. You're more their guide. So I would say, don't tell people also like how, how to feel obviously, but like where to feel it or what they should be feeling. Like, let's say, and it's innocent stuff. So let's just be clear here. This, this, we, like you said, we all have done, and I'm sure I still do it um, on occasion. Um, So again, this is nothing, you know, bad or wrong. We're just trying to enlighten, (laughs) shed some light on this all. So let's say you're doing a hip flexor stretch or you're like, you're down on one knee. So one is four, you're down on one knee, or maybe someone's sitting on a chair. So half sitting on a chair. So you're right sit bones on the chair, you're sitting sideways on it. Yeah. Right foot's down on the ground and your left knee is on like a bolster or something, right? On the ground. So you're in this half kneel position and you're stretching the hip flexor. And you just say, you know, and, and feel the stretch through the front of the thigh. Like that, that's okay. Like, I mean, I'm sure I still say it ever, but I'm trying not to, I am trying to change my language in the last few years and not even you don't need to, you don't need to tell them even, right? You can, you ask questions. So remember yoga is really a practice of awareness, obviously, and inquiry and curiosity and exploration to get, to have you yourself gain more insight and understanding into the cause, root cause of your suffering. And then, and then you can calm the fluctuations of the mind kind of thing. Like, <laughs> so, so we're providing them with, you know, an exploration. So when you get them into that, um, or you're not getting them, you see my language, you're not getting them into that position. So when you're guiding the person, um, you know, into this experience, you can say when they're stretching, um, when you're doing this particular stretch, all you can just say, feel the, feel the weight in the front of the foot, feel the sit bone on the chair, feel your knee on the ground. Like you're just bringing them into the body you can still say, feel any sensations you may be experiencing at the side of the hip, the front of the hip, the back of the hip, find your breath. Um, as you inhale, notice any sensations through the front of the belly. Right. You inhale, does it, does it transfer? Do you feel sensations anywhere else? Because sometimes, now what I'm alluding to is often we, that connection of the diaphragm to the psoas. So when we inhale, you can often feel the so like you can feel it on that whole left side, you're stretching the left. But I won't suggest that or tell them that. I, instead, I create language to maybe guide them to just that area and guide the breath, and then maybe they'll and they may not have the same experience that you and I have. Right, that's so, that's, so key. That is really key, and for people in pain, everybody, but for people in pain. And then two more little points is just, um, and I sort of said that's already, but really cultivating a language of exploration and being curious about the pain. So not to be afraid of the pain, but to be curious about it. You still want to respect it. You still want to listen to it and monitor it. So we're not saying ignore it, but we are saying be curious about it. And what what we're really trying to do is change people's relationship to the pain. And that's something that might be a little more one-on-one and, you know, private settings, but in a class setting, you can still cultivate that for sure. And also, I just want to add in there that I I see a lot of people be very frustrated or angry with their pain or with the body part where they're feeling the pain. So I love how you're bringing this in, that it's not like we're trying to tell them, ignore this pain, but we start to look at that relationship. Right, yeah. Well, connected yoga teachers, I want to hear from you. What is your key takeaway? How can you use what you learned today in your own yoga practice or in the classes that you're teaching? I love how Shelly spin things around right at the very top of the episode. And I feel like every time I talk to her, she does this in a fun and playful way. So thank you so much, Shelly, for all of your information that you shared with us today. I love to look at this idea of saying persistent pain versus chronic pain and that the right term really depends on who you're talking to. I've been looking at my own language as IQ classes and avoiding those directives like that. B 
be careful or keep or put or make sure, ensure to protect or to save. And one of the big ones, as I talk about in this episode, is I'll say, put a blanket under your knees to protect the knees. So instead, I love how Shelly said, we can say, put a blanket under your knees for a little more luxury. So let's build a little library of cues. Shelly had given us mindfully, slowly, with presence, pay attention, notice, focus on, see if you can try this or try not to in a playful way, choose your own adventure, try this option. What cues do you use with your students when you avoid directives? How do you invite in this curiosity, awareness, and this giving permission and empowerment to your students? If you have some others that you would love to share, please go back to our show notes, theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 116 and share a comment there. I love to hear from you. And speaking of amazing connected yoga teachers reaching out, Jenny McGoy, thank you so much for taking the time to send a voicemail. I love that. I love also that I can just reply and I don't need to know your phone number. (laughs) It just goes via email. It's like magic. If you're wanting to leave me a voicemail, that's on the connectedyogateacher.com. Just look for the button over on the right-hand side. Also, a shout out to Tara Drake, who left us a review saying, I love the useful content that the Connected Yoga Teacher podcasts provide. I've learned several tools from tuning in that have helped me with my business. It has led me to enroll in Shannon's group teacher calls, which are well worth the money. Tara goes on to say, Shannon generously shares her time and wisdom selflessly. She is a true class act who displays acts of compassion and honesty in the advice she shares. I can't thank her enough for what both podcasts and group Zoom calls have given me. Thank you so much, Tara. I feel like I'm working on this practice of really taking in a compliment. I feel like I learned this from Diane Liska. (laughs) It might have even been on a podcast episode. So... Just thank you so much for leaving a review. It means so much. If you haven't left a review yet, you can do that either via iTunes or on our Facebook page. Huge thank you to our team at The Connected Yoga Teacher, Samantha, Suzanne, Crunch, and Cindy. You have not only made today's episode possible, but you made it possible that I could go away for almost three weeks to Bermuda and lead a training and batch the episodes and have most of April all planned out because you all worked so hard behind the scenes. So a huge thank you for doing that. And I learned a lot through batching. I might have to do a podcast episode on that topic. Okay, connected yoga teachers, it's time to sign off until next week, part two, right back here at the same time, same day. And I want to know what will you be doing this week to stay connected? Maybe it's to yourself, your yoga practice or to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. 